All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's event. I'm Dr. Leong, your host. Today's event is organized by Laharot YMCA and to be. This event is live streamed via Facebook. Today's speaker is Dr. Richard Ng, and the topic will be Epo founded by Hakka, made vibrant by the Cantonese. Today's program, we have a welcome, followed by the presentation by Dr. Richard Ng. The topic will be Epo founded by Hakka, made vibrant by Cantonese. And a, talk, a little bit about the Epo Cantonese Heritage Trail, the important landmarks in the trail, and how this trail will attract more tourists and businesses to Epo. Following the talk, there will be a question and answer session and then a little presentation about La Hard Road YMCA mission and then celebrating happy that is a new year 2022 and then we have the end and we would like to invite all of us for the chit chat at the end of the session so that we can uh, maybe mini brainstorm on ideas of how to um, Today we have a distinguished speaker Associate Professor Dr. Richard Ng he holds a PhD in Business Administration from Open University, Malaysia. He is an Ipoh City Councillor since May 2020. He is the President of the Ipoh City Watch, President of the Lions Club of Perak Silver State, Chairman of the Coalition of Perak Caring NGOs, and he is attached to the Open University, Malaysia as Supervisor for Masters and PhD candidates. He is also Director of Academic for the Loyal Academy UTM Space Program in Ipoh, and also Director of Perak Eclat TVET Sindran Bahat, a company appointed by the Perak State Government to implement TVET programs. He has got several awards with him, Best of Best and Best in Climate Action from JCIM, Silver Medal for Best Paper by Asia Association of Open Universities, and awarded the Bronze Medal for Best Paper by the International Conference for Distance Education. Uh, without much further ado, please uh, welcome the Professor Dr. Richard Ng. Dr. Richard, please take over the stage. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Leong. Very good evening to all of you. Taika Man Xiong Ho. Okay, first of all, wish you Happy Chinese New Year. Hong Si Fa Chai. Uh, Sun in Fai Lok and uh, Sun Tai Kinong. Uh, this is how the Cantonese, uh, of course, the Cantonese, they have a very thick culture. They also reach people, Kong Si Fa Chai, that's Mandarin, Kong Hei Fa Chai. So the Cantonese, uh, you must understand, from those days, uh, they always, always like to gamble. So they always, always wish people uh, good luck in gambling or in whatever you do. Okay? So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Much, Leung, Dr. for. Leung. For the uh, introduction, uh, in fact, this is the second time I was invited to speak to this uh, platform. Uh, I think this is a great idea to have such a platform to allow the public uh, to have free access to uh, information. Otherwise, you've got to pay for this kind of talk, uh, seminar and all that. Uh. So that's the beauty of having Zoom, uh, Google Meet and so on. Uh. Okay, without much uh, uh, delay, let me show you my slides. Uh. Okay, there you are. So the topics tonight is about Ipo, founded by Hakka and made vibrant by Cantonese. So this topic is a bit controversial because if you ask the Hakka, uh, of course I give uh, I... It's muted, eh? So give a respect to the Hakka because the Hakka really founded Ipo. So I will explain to you why. Then in the process, uh, we found that in the city, there are a lot of these Cantonese uh, doing their usual trade. Uh. They have all the skills, carpentry uh, and other skills, foundry and so on. Uh. So they are the one who actually, uh, you know, create a business opportunity in the city. Uh. The Hakka, they are mainly tin miners. Because they have a lot of money, they develop Ipo, they build buildings, they build houses. Eh? Otherwise, Ipo will be 
a kampong. Okay, yeah? okay. Now I will start with an overview. Okay, what happened? Huh? Okay, let me slide got jam a bit. One minute, eh? Okay, never mind. So the the slide was okay. No, no jam, huh? Because it's a uh, quite a big file. It's 134 megabyte, uh, full of pictures, huh? So anyway, I, what I'm trying to tell you is about why uh, this uh, research was conducted. So I became the Ipo City Councillor on uh, on May the 5th, uh, 2020. Then there was a new mayor started on 1st April, 2020. So when he came in, he brought with him a lot of, uh, uh, of his past experience. Of course, he was the director of uh, PTG, uh, the Perak. Uh, land uh, director, okay. okay. Why? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So he came, he brought with him was experience. I told you the first thing, of course, being a new mayor, he wants to ensure uh, something new is being done for Ipo. And the first thing when he took over, of course, it was during the COVID pandemic. And he found that there were people, uh, people become poor. And uh, in one of the meetings he did raise, he says, uh, I remember at that time we had some people committed suicide among the Indian community. Then we found even the Malays also committed, committed uh, suicide. The Malays seldom uh, commit suicide because of their strong uh, religion, uh, the Islamic religion that uh, prevent their people from committing suicide, but yet we found many of them, uh, uh, you know, committed suicide. And how about Chinese? Then we do a research and we found that actually Chinese is worse off. Of course, you don't hear Chinese commit suicide. There are one or two cases, but those people who committed suicide, you know, they are the Tauke eh, who jump from the tall building. Uh, you have heard about that. Eh? But we seldom heard about poor people jumping from the building unless they have cancer or terminal, terminally ill and all that. So we found that Ipo has got the poorest Chinese in Malaysia. So I straight away, I'm not in charge of the Chinese community. I'm just the head of the environment department. So realizing that I have this expertise because being a professor in the business faculty and, uh, you know, I was the head of the strategic management uh, unit. So I proposed several ideas. One of which is, remember, uh, that was 2020. We are still under COVID pandemic. We are still under lockdown. And yet I said, we got to prepare from 2020 to open up our economy. Uh, one of the easiest is to tourism. And I did mention, uh, I quote the mayor, I says in Cantonese, Lo Tong, Choi Tong. Okay, I mean, uh, low tongue means if the road is open up, then the luck will also come in, right? So we must open up the road, uh, low tongue. Open up the road, then the luck will come in, right? And for this reason, I say let's look at how we can revitalize uh, tourism. At the moment, Ipo, we only have what we call the Ipo Heritage Trail with only 24 spots. And these 24 spots are mainly the British uh, architecture and all that. Of course, the Heritage Trail also involves some, some uh, Chinese uh, architecture or Chinese history. For example, we have Ho Yan Ho, the Han Chin Petsu, we have Kong Heng, and the, uh, uh, you know, Palo Kumio, Chung Tai Ping building and all that. There are few, right? But this is not part of the British Heritage Trail, right? So. I said that uh, we need to develop a new trail. Of course, prior to this, there are a lot of people developing several kind of trails. For example, we have Tin Miners Trail, we have the Coffee Trail, we have the Food Trail, we have the Sun Yat Sen Trail, and so many other trails. Anybody can develop any trail. But for me, we need to look at the economy of the Chinese. Why tourism is important? Because the Indian, if they are poor, they don't have a job, we need to create job for them. We provide minimum salary, they will grab it, right? 
the Malays equally the same. They need job. You provide them a job, they will take up the job. But if you provide the same job, the same salary, the Chinese refuse to take up this kind of job because the Chinese doesn't want a 1,000 over ringgit or 2,000 ringgit paid job. They want to be, they want to have freedom. They want to do business. They want to be on their own, right? Become their own boss. So because of this, for the Chinese community, we need to develop business opportunity. So what kind of business that we can do during COVID pandemic? You want to sell food? You cannot sell food. There are no buyers and so on. At that time, remember, huh? that time, the e-commerce, the, the what you call Lazada and uh, Shopee were not really, uh, what you call, significant yet. And only after sometimes, towards the end of the year, then people started to explore using that e-commerce platform. And now we have more than two platforms. Uh, we even have uh, other, uh, what you call, uh, private, uh, privately developed platform and so on. So I will not talk about that. Perhaps maybe in the next talk, uh, Dr. Leong, we can talk about e-commerce. Uh, I'm also, uh, I've done that, that talk before, all right? Okay, tonight we will focus on that trail. So if you can see on the screen on the left side, is the Ipo Heritage Trail, the original Ipo Heritage Trail. On the right side, you can see the Ipo Town Hall, right? And then at the bottom is the railway station. Of course, these are very unique British architecture, right? But as I said just now, if you want to earn tourism dollar, you cannot have this kind of a heritage trail because so far we have seen Ipo has never uh, attracted uh, all the white men to, to come to Ipoh. The white men always prefer to go to Penang, Bangkok, uh, this uh, Pulau Tioman, Pulau Perhentian, Singapore, KL, and so on. Eh? There's nothing actually in Ipoh. They want to see tin mine. Do you think the British, the American, the white men want to see the tin mine? We have the TT5 there. Right? We can check how many people actually go to TT5. So we cannot depend on the, the, the what you call the white man's uh, tourism dollar. And we must bear in mind the white man, I'm sorry, huh? I'm not racist. The white man, they prefer to go to a country which is clean, which is environmental friendly, huh? which protect the environment and so on. And then uh, Ipo at that time, we don't have that repetition yet. Of course, in 2016, you know, Lonely Planet has recommended Ipo as the sixth uh, most uh, visited uh, destination. So after 2016, what happened? Of course, they successfully attracted about 7.4 million tourists to come to Ipoh. But even that, not enough. Now, the city is focusing on what? Health tourism. Right? Health tourism. Now, they build a lot of private hospitals to attract people to come and seek treatment. And then that's how we earn that, that tourist money. Of course, we also have Geopark and so on. Uh. But all these things doesn't attract the Chinese tourists. Chinese, we look at Guangzhou itself, we can easily attract 60 million people from Guangzhou, from Macau, from Hong Kong, even from Singapore. These are Cantonese-speaking uh, tourists. Eh? When they come to Ipoh, what do they see? What do they want to see, actually? Just put ourselves in the shoes of tourists. If we go and visit Thailand, what do we expect from Thailand? Right? We expect uh, some Thai good food. We expect to see, of course, some of the, uh, what you call the temple, the Siamese temple. Of course, shopping, right? Big thing, shopping. Of course, uh, people go and enjoy, go for massage and things like that. Good food huh? in the Thailand. Why do people go to Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, Hanoi? Because they want to visit uh, what you call the, the some of the, uh, the French and American war left behind. But of course, actually, it's not that. There are more to that. Eh? In Vietnam, uh, the the conversion rate, eh? Malaysian ringgit to Vietnam is still very good. Eh? We still can uh, can spend quite a lot in uh, Vietnam. Uh, those days, before the financial crisis, our ringgit versus baht, you know, is uh, ten dollars. You can exchange to uh, hundred and twenty baht. Today is the other way around. Okay, so it's quite uh, expensive for us. Okay, so to cut things short. What are the things actually that can attract these Chinese tourists to Ipoh? 
You tell them we have a lot of temple. In China, we have a bigger temple than Ipoh. You say we have caves. There are bigger caves in China. Why do they need to come to Ipoh? Right? Of course, a lot of these people, uh, I will go into that history a bit, then you understand. Uh, the history of migrants uh, from China to Ipoh happened in the early 19th century. Uh, I will go into it uh, afterwards and you will realize why we need to seek tourism dollar from Kongjo afterwards. Eh? Okay, so let me now share with you the four trails that we have proposed, right? The existing trail is HT2. So we actually code name it, eh? like James Bond movie, eh? we code name it, we call it HT2. Actually, to be honest, eh? the Chinese trail is HT1. Eh? I think along the way, some people objected. They say no, we cannot have a Chinese trail as HT1. We must put the Malay trail. Okay, Malay Trail, we change to Malay Trail, HT1. Then HT2, Colonial Trail. HT3 is the Chinese Heritage Trail. And then the Indian uh, Trail, uh, uh, HT4. Then we, we presented the, the whole idea. Uh, then the state exco, YB Datonuli says, we must not seem to be very racist. Can we change or not the Malay Trail to some other name? The Indian trail, the Chinese trail, let's not use Malay, Indian, Chinese. So after that, we change it. We call the HD Trail 1 as Datuk Panglima Kinta Heritage Trail. It's not ready, eh? let me tell you. There are about eight spots uh, along the river from uh, Kampung Palo, Kampung Kuchai, right up to Kampung Istana near the Kinta River, uh, the river walk eh? until the Kepayang area. So we have the Malay trail. Eh? So we have changed it to Datuk. Datuk Panglima Kinta Heritage Trail. Then the, the colonial, the Ipoh Heritage Trail now has been renamed as Colonial Heritage Trail. Of course, if you go to Ipoh, you see a lot of the stone eh, written there still as Ipoh Heritage Trail. Uh, that was the built before we make this kind of decision in the Ipoh City Council. Then for the Chinese Trail, we call it the Cantonese Heritage Trail. Right? We don't call it Chinese. Eh? As I said, we must not be seen to be racist. So therefore, we propose Cantonese. So why Cantonese? So this is a subject. We're going to talk about it tonight. And then for the Indian Trail, we have Little India, of course. Uh, we will not want to call it Indian Trail. Right? I said, uh, actually, the Indian were among the first to arrive in Ipoh, eh? not the Chinese. The Indian arrived, they do some other trading. Right? And then later on, they joined the Chinese tin miners. Uh, the Indian were not involved in the tin mine. They were involved in the rubber plantation. But the Indian, the Chetir, uh, especially, they are the money lender. So we must remember, when these Hakka miners came from China, they were poor Chinese who migrated. Uh, they are migrant, we call it. Uh, remember, there's uh, the, the European call this uh, Hakka, the Jews of the... Uh, east, uh, the Jews of the, they can survive everywhere. They go everywhere in the world, same like the Jews. Uh. So, uh, so they came to uh, Malaya, uh, we call it Malaya, Nanyang. Uh, there's a word, one word on Nanyang. Actually, South China. Nanyang is uh, comprised of uh, Singapore and Malaya at that time. Uh, all right, so South China. So they came, they landed in uh, Penang. So today, if you go to Penang, Penang is rich with heritage. Uh, so I visited Penang. Those days, when I was not a counsellor, I don't even bother to look at the heritage. But today, uh, just about a month ago, I visited Penang. I really appreciate the heritage in Penang, right? And uh, the first thing I would like to visit in Penang is the temple. Because when Chinese migrants come to Malaysia, uh, they need protection. So that's why they built temple to protect them from any, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, you know, any uh, any bad things from happening. Of course, to also help them in their business, to help them to cari makan and all that. Okay, so we found this temple. And this temple, either they are by the sea or by the river. So if you go to any temple by the river or by the sea, you will find a lot of this heritage temple. So I found two, I will elaborate afterwards, okay? So but bear in mind, huh? so why they call the HT3 or the Chinese Heritage Trail as Cantonese? This is the subject of our talk tonight. Okay, 
So I took the initiative. I was not paid. Huh? This is a pro bono kind of service. I don't have to do huh? just like any other counselor. They don't have to do. They will still collect their allowance and all that. But I took the initiative because after the the mayor told me that we have the, the highest number of Chinese poor Chinese in Ipoh. I tell you, the first thing is it is my responsible being appointed as a counselor to help the Chinese community. So the first thing is I I met uh, my research assistant called Mr. Wong Tian Hing. Eh? So he is my research assistant. Of course, he was uh, he is a Sinchu uh, reporter, very well versed because he interviewed a lot of people. Of course, he's more in Mandarin and more in English. So we sit down together, we uh, do this research together. So he some, uh, supplied to me a lot of uh, information from Chinese books, Chinese literature, give me an idea who to meet and all that. So I said I wanted to meet three big Chinese association. So we met three Chinese association. The first one is Namhoi, Perak Namhoi Association. The second is Perak Punyi Association. The third is Perak. Uh, Suntak Association, right? So let me make clear, before I took up this research, I know I'm a Chinese, but I don't know what kind of sub-ethnic group I belong to. And after taking up this research, I realized, uh, of course, I'm a Cantonese. My mother is a Nyonya, so my father is a Cantonese, pure Cantonese, uh, married my, my mom, which is a Nyonya. So I brought up uh, in Ipoh, but my family, we have deep root in Malacca, so we have this Baba Nyonya thing. So I will not talk about Baba Nyonya. Actually, I can, I can talk a lot of things about uh, Baba and Nyonya because I I kind of brought up with my mom in the Nyonya, uh, Baba Nyonya environment. My father also speak Malay uh, in the house with my mom and all of us speak Malay. Only after I entered secondary school, I start to learn Chinese language. Chinese language means Cantonese. Uh, right? So uh, I realized after talking to, to these three associations, these three associations actually they represented three big community in China. One from the Namhoi district. Right? Of course, we have the Pongzhou district. Then we have this small little district in Pongzhou. Right? Uh, Pongzhou is like province like that. Eh? Of course, we call it Pongtong. Eager uh, province, Pongtong. Then the sub one is called Pongjo, and then the sub sub uh, district. And then we have Namboy, we have Sunta, we have Puni. These are the three major Cantonese all right, district, sub district in Pongjo. And these are the people who came to uh, Malaysia in the Kinta Valley. right? Before they came in, of course, we have the Hakka who came in first. They were the teen miners. So they came in, and you know, uh, those days, the people in China, they are all very poor. And there were also problems in the Chinese uh, government at that time, the Qing dynasty. Yeah? Uh, they ill treat these people. They are not fair. The people, uh, you know, cannot earn a, a good, uh, what you call, living lifestyle and all that. They, they were all basically very poor. So the Hakka are people who stay mainly by the countryside. The Cantonese are staying in the city. Yeah? mainly in the city, the Hakka, they stay by the countryside. Uh, you know, for most of uh, your the listeners' information, Hakka, actually the word Hakka means uh, gas. Hakka, Hakyan. Uh. Hakyan is gas, actually. So when they came to the Pongjo city, they were treated as gas. And of course, they are not welcome in the city, uh, just for your information. Of course, the Cantonese and Hakka, they are not in good terms. Uh because of the uh, gap in the economy and uh, other social status and all that. But the Hakka, they are good miners because they stay by the, the countryside. They are very good miners. They are, their skill is in mining, huh? uh, whether mining silver or gold. Of course, tin mine is not a problem. So they were the first, as I said, they are like Jews. Uh, when they, they got the opportunity, eh, when British attacked this uh, Canton eh, and the Chinese government uh, was defeated, so the British took over that the Pearl, uh, Pearl River, Pearl River, 
there were 13 factories uh, controlled by the Chinese government. Those days in China, the British can only do business with the Chinese at that particular uh, Pearl River, or we call it the Chichang River. There were 13 rivers, uh, 13 factories. They only can trade with these 13 factories. And the mode of business is uh, by using silver. They cannot use the British pound, right? British pound is not acceptable. So the Chinese government says, uh, you need to, you only accept silver. So you know why the British uh, throughout the world, they mine for gold, silver, and other things, uh, right? So they were quite pissed off. The British were quite pissed off. So they found that this is a bit difficult for them. So what they do, because many of you have heard of the Opium War, so the British, they defeated the Chinese government in Canton using opium. They go and, what do you call, provide opium to these Chinese people, Chinese army and all that. And then they were addicted. They did not fight. They become weak, then they were defeated. So after that, when the British take control, not only they control the 13 factories, they successfully created five ports along the Pearl River. And then they also uh, successfully got this uh, Hong Kong and Macau. Uh. So Hong Kong become another uh, entry port uh, for the British, uh, ruled by a British until 1997. Uh. Right? You all heard about the history. So when British rule Canton, so that was the good opportunity for the Hakka to come out and follow the British because at that time, the British were already in Malaysia. They were, uh, they came to Malaysia, they took over uh, Era, Pahang, Nevis, Milan, uh, uh, and Selangor, right? Become the Federated Malay States. So they successfully controlled these states through the Pankor Treaty in 1874. So I will go into that afterwards. That's why you see uh, in the third uh, sentence, the Ipo Cantonese Heritage Trail, is based on the influence of tin miners that helped build Ipoh from 1880. Actually, I told you, I found the two temples, the Kuan Yin Temple in Georgetown and the, the other Taipakpung Temple uh, at Tanjung Toko. Uh, the Kuan Yin is 1729, dated 17, uh, sorry, 28. And then the Taipakpung near Tanjung Toko is dated 1799. They only came to uh, Ipoh after 1880s. So that is exactly about 100 years later. So they were already in Penang. So you can see a lot of these Chinese migrants, they were already in Penang. They were not in the tin mining business. They were doing trading with the Indian and other uh, other international committee, the British, uh, the Portuguese, and uh, uh, what you call the uh, uh, other people, uh, Pakistanis and all that. Uh. They were is a busy port uh, at that time in uh, uh, Penang. So when tin was found, actually the first people found tin are the Malays. Uh. So the Malays, they use dulang. Uh, they pan the, the tin. Uh. So that method is so slow, they cannot even uh, you know, collect enough tin. So when after the Pankor Treaty, the British took possession, took control of the state. Uh, they were ruled by the, the governor, residence governor. The, the sultan was surrendered to this British, in return, the British uh, allowed the Sultan to collect uh, toll, collect tax, right? So I will go into that afterwards, huh? right? So uh, why uh, Cantonese? Huh? Because Cantonese, for Ipo, Cantonese is very unique. You cannot find Cantonese culture in other parts of Malaysia. Of course, you can find a little bit in uh, KL, but now KL has slowly turned into Mandarin speaking. You go to Klang, you find a lot of Hokkien. You go to Penang, of course, totally Hokkien. Even though there are a lot of Cantonese there. I will go into that afterwards. And then in Malacca, of course, we have the Baba Nyonya. They are also Hokkien. I visited Johor recently about uh, in December, on December 19. I was there uh, during the convocation of UTM. Uh. So I was there. I uh, make a short tour in uh, Johor. I couldn't find that many Chinese in the city. The Chinese in Johor, they were scattered everywhere. In the city itself, you only can find Jalan uh, Wong Ah Fok. Uh. He was a captain uh, appointed by the Sultan. Uh, those are Hokkien who came to uh, involve in uh, what you call agriculture business, uh, not in tin. There's no tin in Johor. Uh. Okay. 
So Ipoh is very unique. The only city in Malaysia you can find real thick Cantonese culture. Okay. Okay. Now I share with you the three waves, a uh, major wave of migrants, uh, migrants of Chinese to Malaya. The first wave happened about 500 to 700 years ago. A lot of people say it was 1411, right? Uh, 1411, according to some literature, uh, it was written that the Malay Sultan, uh, at that time, Sultan Mahmud, then we have Sultan Iskandar and Sultan Ismail and all that, they actually went to China. Because China, uh, before that, they already sent Marco Polo to investigate this part of the place. Eh? But Marco Polo never landed in Malacca. Marco Polo landed in Sumatra and found there's a group of Malays there. Right? They found, he found some uh, group of Malays and basically he reported there's nothing. Then across the street, overlooking Malacca, he said it's still very much a kampong, nothing there. Right? So at that time, Marco Polo was sent by Kublai Khan eh, to, to take a look. Because Marco Polo, he actually write map. Eh? So he came, reported back to Kublai Khan. He said, there's nothing. And that was a long time ago. Eh? And then, the, of course, some of the Chinese who accompanied Marco Polo, they stay behind in Sumatra. So we have a small a portion of China Pranakan in Sumatra. That's how the Chinese started in Indonesia. Then some of these Chinese, they only came to uh, Malacca in uh, 1411 after the Sultan sent uh, that uh, a group of this uh, Sultan and the people uh, to China to meet the Chinese government, right? And then uh, to look for protection. Because at that time, uh, it was uh, uh, there was news that the Siamese government wanted to attack the year, right? So uh, they sent people to China, came back, and after that, not first time, eh? not one time. So 1411 followed by 1412, 1413, 1414. Then after that, uh, the, the Chinese uh, uh, king, eh? I can't remember who, then presented this Hang Li Po to the Sultan of uh, Malacca, eh? Malacca Sultan Sultan Mahmud, eh? uh, Princess Hang Li Po. But this is a story which is still a story hearsay. Even Professor Ku Ke Kim cannot certify this is true. But if you say it is not true, then if you go to Malacca, there's one Bukit China with 12,000 cemetery. The, the, the last cemetery was dated 1621. So if people live for 17 years, so you take 1621 minus 70, uh, that was the last grave, you know, last tombstone written 1621. And then what about the er earlier people? So there are 12,000 people buried there, the Chinese. So these people must have come much earlier. So we call this the first wave. And they all uh, ended uh, assimilating the Malay culture. They live with the Malay and all that. Of course, some converted to Muslim, but many never convert to Muslim. Just like my parents, they only follow the Malay culture, but we never convert to Muslim. Of course, we eat rice with hand. We eat the, the curry, uh, and then we make the kueh, you know, and all that. Huh? All these are uh, basically uh, made by the Malay. So we, we have uh, accepted huh? this culture assimilated to the Baba Nyonya. In fact, uh, during Hari Raya, my family celebrated Hari Raya. We make a two-part lemang, right? Then the, during Chinese New Year, we celebrate Chinese New Year. Uh, Deepawali, we celebrate Deepawali. Christmas, we also celebrate Christmas. So a bit unique. But if you go to Malacca, we cannot say it's a Cantonese heritage trail. We have to say Baba Nyonya. Nobody can really uh, say this is not true. The Baba Nyonya is already a heritage. And then, of course, we got a Chetty heritage in Malacca. Right? There's a group of Chetty who also, like the, the Baba Nyonya, they have assimilated into the Malay culture. Right? And then we have uh, other culture. But the two prominent ones is the Baba Nyonya and the Chetty. So this is the first wave, but so far nobody can say exactly when did Hang Li Po came to uh, Malacca. Huh? Nobody have the exact date. Okay, then the second wave. This is what we're going to talk about tonight. The second wave is 1880 to 1990. This is when 
after the British took over, took control of uh, Canton, this is a big opportunity for the Chinese to get out. And remember that time, there's no immigration. No, no need to have passport. You can just follow the British or, uh, you know, a lot of Chinese, uh, they actually sail by using the tongkang, uh, tongkang the sailboat uh, held by the wind. So I tell you, uh, there is no document to show how many uh, Chinese actually migrated out of China to other countries. You know, these people, they landed in Singapore, some landed in Penang, some went to other countries. In fact, Chinese are everywhere throughout the world. The Chinese can survive. Why? Because if they stay back in China during the Ming Dynasty, they will be worse off, they will be much poorer. So they take opportunity and sail off. And I tell you, there are many people who died along the way because this, the port takes uh, many, many months. Uh, from China, Guangzhou to, to Singapore, is a, it's about one month, uh, according to some, some books, uh, says one month. So one month, 30 days, uh, with uh, you know very less food, no medicine and all that, they were exposed to scurvy because they are lack of vitamin C, vitamin B. So many people died and their body were just thrown into the sea. So nobody had that document. So the Chinese people who migrated out, of course, their family have no idea whether these people who came to, who went to other countries, whether they survive or they don't survive. But those who survive and landed in, uh, in uh, let's say, in Penang, after that, they made their way uh, by sailing to Kuala Sepetang. There's a river there, Sungai Sangga Besar. If you go to Kuala Sepetang, you will see that uh, that river, all right? Uh, the mouth of the river is called Sungai Sangga Besar. So they went through that, and that's where the port belt is developed. So the people landed there. From there, they travel on land. Of course, at that time, there's no proper road system. And then, of course, at that time, we heard of the name like Long Jaffa, and so on, Nga Ibrahim, and all that. So you read that part. So they found tin and then they, they mine the thing. Of course, who are the people there? There are big groups of Chinese there. So we have two very prominent groups. Group one is called Gihi, the other one is called Haisan, right? And of course, there are two great leaders there. Uh, one is Chin, Chin Ayam, the other one is called Chung Keng Kui, eh, which, uh, you know, later become Kapitan China, right? Uh, Kapitan China appointed by the British, right? And then recognized by the Sultan. Okay, then uh, of course, when they started to mine, they become their coolies. Eh? They're not bosses, you know. All these hakka who came, they are coolies. They work for the British, right? They are just coolies. They work very hard. They slog. Then they earn enough, uh, earn small amount of money. Not even like uh, what the Bangladeshi are earning. They earn, they save, they eat very little, and whatever food they eat, they will save a little bit. They will pack and so on and then after a few months they they go back to china so they will bring the, the packed food together with some money and go back to china and some very enterprising they learn the trades they get to know uh you know the british who control the license at that time right? not the sultan so the british control the license if you are good to them you apply for the permit they will give you the permit but you need money so where do they get the money of course, from their saving, and many of them borrowed from the chetty. Eh? Uh, let me tell you. So we also, some of these Chinese, they also owe uh, their, their, what they call, uh, gratefulness to the chetty. Eh? So the chetty, Little India in uh, Ipoh, there's another research being done, but I'm not involved, eh? because there's so much to do with the uh, Chinese eh? research. Okay, then present day, of course now, you also find a lot of Chinese migrate to Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and other countries. But those days, the migration was due to a poor living condition. Lack of job, lack of economy, a business opportunity, no income. They, have, they are forced to leave China. They came to Malaysia. Then they earn enough, they go back to China. Some people save money uh, to fight the, uh, the Qing dynasty at the time. Uh, led by our Dr. Sun, Sun Yat-sen. And in 1940, when the Japanese attacked China, a lot of these Chinese Tauke, they also provide financial help. And some people like uh, 
uh, Ho Tap Ming, uh, our uh, Ho Kai Ming, uh, this Ho Yan Ho founder, he also went back to China and go for war and fight. Then he came back to Malaya. The Japanese were looking for him. He was hiding in uh, Malinawa and all that. All right? So this is another story. Yeah? Okay, so the third wave basically are rich people. The second wave are poor people. Right? They are known as the uh, WAQ. In Cantonese, we call WAQ. WAQ means, WA means Chinese. Q means uh, the bridge. Right? So WA means Chinese from China. They built a bridge in another country. So we are all called WAQ. The first generation of Chinese who come to Malaysia, they are called WAQ. Then the second generation who took over, they are a little bit WAQ. And we are the third generation, we are no longer WAQ. They are the citizen of Malaysia. That's why when people call us pendatang, that's not true. The pendatang may be the first generation, may be true. But we are not, not the pendatang. We are born here, we got passport, we are the citizen. We don't even think about China today. If you don't believe, you watch the badminton eh? uh, competition between Lin Dan and Li Chong Wei. So during the, the uh, Thomas Cup eh, between Lin Dan and Li Chong Wei, as a Chinese Malaysian, we don't support Lin Dan. We will support Li Chong Wei because we are Chinese Malaysian. We don't support Chinese China. right? But our first generation, in those days, there is Li Chong Wei versus uh, uh, Lin Dan. I think our first generation will support Lindan rather than support Li Chong Wei. Right? If you ask this question, you, you may think uh, the word, the, the actually mentality, uh, our mind is still with China. But today, our mind, our heart, our soul is in Malaysia because all of us uphold our Rukun Tetangga. First Rukun Tetangga says what? Taat setia kepada Raja dan Negara. True enough. So we are the, the generation. But today, the rich Chinese, they come to Malaysia and other parts of the world. Why? Because they want to run away from the congested city, from the pollution, from the, uh, uh, what you call, not so free country, yeah? because it's uh, run by the communist government. Yeah? So they all want to go away from the country. They got money, they will go to other country, they go and apply for uh, citizenship. So many of them got second citizenship in other country. People like Jack Ma and many other people. So the Chinese government recently, they put a stop. Those who have dual citizenship will be blacklisted from listing in Weibo. Weibo is uh, the uh, Facebook version, right? The, the online version for Facebook. So when they are banned, they cannot do business in China. So quickly, these people, they surrender their citizenship and come back to China. And uh, so... Many people come to Malaysia because our government has got this scheme called My Second Home, right? So My Second Home, but uh, it's quite stringent. Huh? You must have how much money in the bank account and so on and all. Then every year you must go back to your home country and all that. But today we got one new scheme called the Forest City in Johor. Huh? Forest City touted as the Shenzhen of Malaysia. If you go to China, Shenzhen is just next to Hong Kong. All Cantonese speaking people. So they developed this forest city on four, uh, what you call uh, island, uh, man-made island in Johor, uh, south of uh, Johor. Uh, we call it the Sri Banda Iskandar, right? Forest city, uh, which uh, can occupy 700,000 people, right? So now they are starting to sell, sell to the Chinese uh, foreigner. So after a lot of, uh, uh, what you call protests, now they open up to 30% to local people, right? buy this property, this forest city. Otherwise, it's wholly owned by the, the Chinese. You know? Okay, now let's look at the statistic. Huh? I got to go a bit fast. It's 8.45. Huh? So you look at this statistic. Huh? This is real. Huh? This data was taken from the Para Administration Report, huh? 1901. Uh, sorry, not 1901, 1950 actually. Huh? Uh, there's an error here. Now you look at Kinta District in 1901. We have Cantonese 55%, Hokkien 9%. The Hakka Hainan, Hainanese have not come in yet in 1901. Eh? Hakka 33%, Hechu 3%. Then I'm talking about Kinta district. Eh? 1911, Cantonese 44%, uh, Hokkien 8%, Hakka 39%. Eh? But of course, you look at the population in Kinta, it is 134,000. 
All right? Earlier was uh, 89,000. So there's an increase. Then we see more Hakka people came to uh, Inta district. 1931, Cantonese 49%, uh, Hakka 39%. 1931, 45% Cantonese 37%. So this shows that even last time, the Cantonese outnumbered Hakka. So that's why I, I, I met the Kain Association. I met Dr. Hugh, the advisor. I met the, the present uh, chairman, uh, uh, engineer Liu. I talked to them. I presented this statistic. They all agree that why I, I want to name it the Cantonese Trail. Uh. Then if you look at Ipoh City, Ipoh Town at uh, the time, uh, uh, the time Ipoh was known as Palo, uh, right, for the Cantonese, it's called Palo, right? And you see in Ipoh itself, we have 52% Cantonese, 19% Hakka. Hokkien trip, uh, sorry, Hokkien 14%. And now we started to see some Hainanese come to Ipoh. 1921, we have 58% Cantonese. Then we have 13% uh, Hokkien, 20% Hakka. Okay, that's Ipoh. Then uh, the first uh, district that the Chinese landed before they come to Kinta district is Ensign district, Telo Intan. Eh? Why you know? Just now I said a group of Chinese, they travel to Kuala Sepetang, through Kuala Sepetang, the Sungai Sangha Besar. Eh? If you have chance, you go there, go and see the, the history there, the port well, all right? Unfortunately, the, the, the railway track, eh? we cannot see it in, in uh, Kuala Sepetang. Then the second, uh, the, the other boat, they sail through Telo Intan or Ensign, they call it. From there, they, the boat sailed through Perak River. So um, uh, about uh, you know midway before Bido, they took the Kinta River, right? There's Perak River uh, flowing through Parade and so on. Eh? So another one is called Kinta River. So the Kinta River, say so they took the boat, they, uh, they sailed through the first town called Kota Baru in Gopeng. And that is where the Chinese landed they stopped in uh, in uh, Goping. The British were already mining tin. And uh, if you heard of the British name called Osborne. Osborne. Eh? So this Osborne, he is uh, uh, actually a miner. He mined gold eh? in many countries, eh? including Australia and so on. Eh? So he was uh, in Goping. So he met this, did these Chinese workers. He brought these Chinese workers and started mining in Goping because he found tin in Goping. They also found it later on in Trono, Batu Gajah. And then, uh, of course, some went to Bido, Temo. Uh, Temo is another interesting town. Uh. If you go to Temo, you also find uh, the, the what they call uh, the building uh, in the town, exactly like Ipoh. So you know it's the same uh, same developer or same architecture from the same uh, Chinese uh, community. Okay? So I want to talk about Ipoh. So you can see from here, all along, the Cantonese have been uh, the leading number of population, uh, a bigger ethnic group in Ipoh. The Hakka is second. You know why? Because the Hakka are minors, and most of these people, they stay outside Ipoh. Many of them are not in Ipoh. They were in uh, other parts like uh, Trono, Gopeng. Right? You can find a lot of Hakka in Gopeng, uh, Bido. Right? Then, the, of course, later when the British uh, took over, they want to control. Because the Hakka and the Cantonese, they were fighting, eh? the Gihi, Naisan and all that. So they were, there were a lot of gang fight and so on. The British we uh, come up with a scheme called uh, regrouping area. So they put a lot of Hakka in uh, Menglembu, in Pusing, in Papan, then in Kampung Tawas, in Ampang Baru, right? You find a lot of Hakka there and so on. But in the town, we find a lot of Cantonese. Eh? That's a uh, uh, you know, uh, subject to some of the literature, as I said just now, I read a lot of literature, I found some evidence, but I cannot say it is uh, true, but this statistic in front of you is a true statistic. Okay, then I, I read, uh, do a research on the statistic provided by the Department of Statistics Malaysia. And this cannot be wrong, but this only shows the whole of Malaysia not in Ipoh, I don't have the, the statistic. So I'm in the process of looking for this statistic. Whole of Malaysia, the biggest Chinese ethnic, sub-ethnic group is Hokkien. 
but they are all mainly by the uh, seaside, eh? in Klang, Penang, right? you, you name it, eh? near the seaside, you find a lot of yeah. Then second biggest group is the Hakka. Now Hakka in Ipoh is less than Cantonese, but there are many Hakka in Sabah and Sarawak for your information. Eh? Right? So the Hakka not only came to Penang and uh, Ipoh, eh? they also landed in Sabah, Sarawak. Right? And then, of course, we have Cantonese. Many of these Cantonese are Nipo, in Kuala Lumpur, in Seremban, eh? right? And uh, some parts of uh, Jaw, Bulog Batu, Pahat, some parts, eh? is it? Then we have Teochew people. So Teochew, basically, they are uh, people in business. Eh? He said they are doing business. They open sundry shop and some doing agriculture, right? And the Fukchow people, they go to Sarawak, eh? They, they, they go in and plant uh, what you call pepper eh, and so on. Eh? Uh, so they are in agriculture business. Then the rest are the Hainanese. Hainanese, they have 4.8%. Uh, just now, if you look at the statistic, you realize that the Hainanese came in later and not many. right? And uh, many of them, they are not in Kinta or even Ipoh. They were in what? Dinding district. The Hainanese, uh, uh, sorry, only later part, 1947. They were in the, sorry, here, uh, the next one here, all right, yes. Uh, they were in Anson, Teluk Intan, they were in Dinding district. Then you look at the Techu also say, right, and all that. Uh. So Hainanese, they came later. When they came later, they actually got no job uh, because all the jobs were taken up, uh, taken up by the Hakka and the Cantonese. So when the Hainanese came, they worked with the British. They worked as a, what you call, a, a, you know, a housekeeper. They helped the British make toast bread, a coffee, and so on. That's why the Hainanese, they are very good in fusion food. Eh? They, Hainanese, they are famous in setting up the kopi tiam. Eh? So you know Hainanese, they are in kopi tiam because they learned this from the British. If you go to China, all right, you go to the Hainan eh, uh, center, you cannot find toast bread, you cannot find curry, you cannot find uh, coffee and all that. They learn this trade eh, in uh, Malaysia, eh, Malaya at that time, they learn from the British. Okay, so another statistic, uh, 2021, last year, you can see, uh, now I have the population, Hokkien, we have 1.9 million people. Hakka 1.7, the biggest, second biggest. The third group is 1.4 million, about 1.4 million, mainly in uh, Ipoh and uh, KL. Then Techu, not bad, or 1 million population. Hainanese, 396,000. Oh, sorry, the last one wrong. Eh? The last one are others. Eh? This one, wrongly. Others include the Min, eh? the Min, South Min, North Min, and Fuk Chow, Hock Chiu, and all that. Eh? So they were, uh, there are 870. I don't have time to break down, but they are quite still weaker in uh, several parts. They are scattered, basically. Okay? Okay. So just now I was talking about the Opium War happened between 1839 to 1842. Right? Between the British and the Qing Dynasty. So the British defeated the Qing Dynasty. The Qing Dynasty surrendered uh, the Pearl River. Uh, the Pearl River. <laughs> Pearl River. Uh, then there's a treaty sign uh, called the Nanking Treaty. Five ports were established, one in Canton, Shanghai, Amoy, Limpo, and uh, Fu Fuchao. Uh. And then later in uh, Malaysia, we have tin mining uh, by Long Jaffa in La Road. And then the Chinese were brought in uh, by the British uh, to come and help in the tin mining. Then, of course, there are two groups there trying to control the tin mining, the Gihin and the Haisan. I told you, told you just now, Gihin, uh, led by this uh, Chinayam and Haisan uh, Chung Keng Kui, eh? right? Uh, of course, uh, later on Chung Keng Kui, he was uh, quite close to the British. Eh? He got the uh, one British man called Andrew, eh? Andrew Clark. Eh? Andrew Clark was the resident at that time based in Singapore. So uh, Chung Keng Kui is quite smart. He got a link, network to one uh, businessman, link him up to Andrew and then uh, discuss with Andrew to uh, come up with an agreement, right? So while this happened, then the Larut War took place again in 1865. 
the third Larut war again between this Gin and Haisan, and not only Gin and Haisan, eh, also among the, the the Malays, you know, we got the Nga Ibrahim, we got the Long Jaffa, we have the Sultan, eh, Raja Abdullah, and all that fighting. Eh. So the Sultan also got headache. They cannot control eh, these people. They also go and engage this British, seek the British to for help. So finally, the British agreed because they found this is an opportunity, golden opportunity to take control of the Perak state government. Eh? So they call all these people, right? The Gihin Haisan group called the Raja Abdullah and uh, Nga Ibrahim and the British. They go to that one uh, ship called HMS uh, Pluto. So they signed an agreement on 1874. Uh, 1874, not 1884, 1874, uh, written wrongly. British take control of the Perak State Administration. They appointed the first resident governor, which is uh, James W. W. Birch, right? And then more workers were brought from China, from where? From the Canton. At the time we call Canton. Canton is Guangzhou. So we brought in, the British brought in a lot of Cantonese to Malaysia, and this is the reason why you look at the statistic, we have more uh, Cantonese people. So why they brought Cantonese instead of Hakka? Okay, just now I told you Hakka, when they came as tin miners, when they started to see tin mining industry is lucrative, they all go back to China, they went back to China, they go to their village and call all the village people, all their friends, hey, come to Malaysia and earn a living. So they brought the Hakka. Then this Hakka, they don't have the skill. They don't have the carpentry skill, they don't have the foundry skill, and uh, so many other skills, right? They are not good cook, so they have no choice to, to bring these uh, Cantonese people who are uh, in the city, they have all the skills, so they brought these people uh, to help, uh, uh, what you call, provide services to the Hakka people. Okay, just now I told you how the Chinese uh, uh, came to uh, this, uh, what you call, Kinta district. Eh? So from Penang, just now I told you they sailed to uh, this uh, Port Bell. Eh? So they ended up in La Road. But La Road, they found that there's not much tin compared to Kinta Valley. Eh? Kinta Valley has the biggest tin deposit in the world. Eh? So from Penang, they sailed to Teluk Intan. They took the Perak River. And then uh, instead of taking the Perak River, they branched to the Kinta River. So they all ended up in eh, this, uh, what they call, Kota Baru. So from here, they explore tin. And later on, they found more tin in Ipoh. At right? the time, Ipoh was still a kampung. Eh? So we have Kampung Palo. At that time, we have this uh, Datuk Panglima Kinta. Eh? At that time, it's controlled by the Datuk Panglima Kinta, appointed by the Sultan eh? uh, station at Kampung Palo. So this boat have to sail to Kampung Palo as a jetty. Now you go to is a people's park, you can still find the jetty there. So we're going to revive the jetty again, all right? And then some of the smaller boats, sampan, the boat cannot travel because the river is getting uh, shallower. So they, they, trans, they use sampan and they manage to reach Gunung Lang. So at Gunung Lang, uh, we have a group of Chinese, uh, tin miners in Kampung Tawas and all that. Because today you go to Gunung Lang, you can still find Gunung Cero and uh, a bit further up, Kampung Kepaya. And then you see there's one Chinese temple called uh, Long Taungam. Long Taungam means the head of the dragon. The tail of the dragon is in Gopeng. So this is the Mai, the tail. This is the Long Tau, Long Mai. So you must understand the history like that. Eh? But a lot of tin were found in this area, the Kinta district. And at that time, Right when the Chinese arrive in Ipoh, all right? Uh, I told you just now. These are the temples uh, I found in Penang just now, right? The temple in Penang, the Kuan Yin Temple. These four pictures are the Kuan Yin Temple established in the year 1728. And later, I found another temple at the Tanjung Toko, founded um, uh, in 1799. Still there. If you have chance, please visit these two temples. Uh, very rich in heritage. Okay, so I will delve into that Kampung uh, Palo later on. Let's look at the prominent Hakka and some Cantonese people. I will go through quickly. Uh, later, maybe Dr. Leong can organize another talk. Uh, I will go part two. 
they have to talk about part <laughs> one. Yeah? So uh, we have people like Leong Fei. Actually, there are many Hakka, many Cantonese, many other Hokkien's who have actually uh, uh, have developed Ipoh. Right? But I will pick 12 people, uh, prominent people. We have Leong Fei, who is a Hakka. Of course, Chung Tai Pin. You know, Chung Tai Pin is the son of Chung Keng Kui. Right? He was also made a Kapitan, uh, Chung Tai Pin, the last Kapitan of uh, China. But Chung Tai Pin was born in Taiping. He was not born in uh, China. His father was born in China. Then Yao Te Xin, of course, came from uh, China. He is an, uh, he, he is an Akka. Then, of course, many of you have heard uh, about Leong Sinam, Yao Te Xin, you know, the bazaar Yao Te Xin, uh, where Octagon is located now. Uh, then we have Leong Sinam, Leong Sinam Street now, famous with Tim Sam. Uh, Lao Pak Kwan, you can find a street name after him in Ipoh Garden, uh, Datuk Sri Lao Pak Kwan. He's the first person uh, uh, who was given the title Datuk Sri uh, by the Sultan. And of course, we have Fung Siong. Uh, Fung Siong he is a foundry, uh, a person uh, with foundry skills. Uh, so he made his money in foundry to support the tin mine industry. Lao Pak Kwan is also, he is a Cantonese. Uh, Fung Siong is a Cantonese, uh, not Hakka. So he also made his money in the tin mining industry. Then we have Yu Tong Sin. Yu Tong Sin is a Cantonese. Uh, of course, he is famous in uh, uh, Chinese uh, medicine. But he's also in the uh, rubber and tin mining industry. Yeah? Uh, Dr. Ho Kai Chiang is a Cantonese. Right? He was born in uh, Hati, Kuala Kangsa. Huh? Right? Then Dr. Wu Lian Te, he's also a Cantonese. But he was born in Penang. Right? Wu Lian Te, father is from China. And then we have Fu Chu Chun. You will see the name, Fu, the street, uh, named after him uh, next to UTC, the market. Uh. Uh, named after Fu Chu Chun, very famous man. He's a Hakka. Lam Looking, uh, Looking, a uh, very nice name. Uh. Uh, quite smart man. Some people say Lam Looking, uh, but he's smart. Uh. He called himself Lam Looking, but his name, real name, is not Lam Looking. Uh. He has got other name, but I think he has. He's an English educated person. He's quite smart. He changed his name, his name to King. Uh. So there's a word King there. Uh, a lot of people respect him, uh, Lam Lok King. And of course, Lam Lok King is famous uh, with the building, Lam Lok King building. There's a Lam Lok King street, but not next to his building. Uh. Lam Lok King is uh, where the first Para Emporium was located. Uh, and before Para Emporium was there, it was used as a cabaret. A lot of people say cabaret is at Taman Jubilee, uh, next opposite Maybank, uh, at Jalan Sultan Idris. Uh, that's Taman Jubilee, the Jubilee Park. Uh, so Jubilee Park, there's a cabaret. By the Lam Lok King building, there's a Jubilee Park also. If you go there, it's a three-story building. Together with Fung Siong, both of them built the first three-story building. Ubi Cinema was built by him. Yeah. Then there's a name. Sorry? Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, it's okay now. Okay. Now the the next behind Ruby Cinema, opposite 15 Clark Street, where Dr. Leong's place is located. Eh? Right opposite, you can find Jalan Lao Eching, very beautiful uh, building there, uh, street, uh, stretch of building was used by this uh, Yasmin Ahmad to film the movie called Sepet. Uh, very famous that, that place. Huh? Okay, so these are the 12 people. So you can see there are Hakka, there's a, there, there, were, there were also Cantonese who actually developed Ipoh. Huh? Uh, but we have to give face to the Hakka. Lah, because the Hakka came first. Huh? They were instrumental in uh, developing Ipoh. Okay, let me stop for a while. There's a problem. Huh? My slide. Okay. Okay. Eh? So the philosophy behind my research is basically based on number one, the second wave. Eh? I am looking at second wave of migrants from China. These are the WAQ people, eh? people who built bridge from China to uh, Malaysia. 
Then focus on tin mining, especially in the Kinta district. And the third, they focus on the Chinese culture. When I say Chinese culture, we have Hakka culture and Cantonese culture, more on Cantonese. Now we have Hakka food and all that, the Yong Tau Fu and all that now already become uh, are becoming famous in Ipoh. Uh, and uh, people say, some say Cantonese food. Huh? Yong Tau Fu is actually a Hakka food. Huh? Uh, so mainly Hakka and China, Cantonese culture, they, they delve on the spiritual and depth. That's why in Ipoh, you can find one street called Hume Street. Uh, Im, Hume Street is a, a street dedicated for the sick and dead people. Until today, we already zone it for your information. Uh. Earlier, they want to move this away. Uh. They said, Suila, this, la. a lot of people uh, said, cannot do business, business not proper, prosperous. Today, if you go to Hume Street, it's prosperous. All the three-story building already rebuilt. And for your information, the Rex Cinema is also going to be rebuilt, taken over by Nirwana. They want to turn into one uh, big, uh, uh, what you call, uh, Olemborium uh, and all that. Uh. So we have recently approved their project, but on condition that they must retain the facade, the Rex Cinema facade. So when they tear down the building, we must have our engineer there to stand by to see that they don't touch the facade of the Rex Cinema. Uh. So this is what we are doing to preserve the, the Chinese uh, heritage uh, in Ipoh. So we have other things like education, health, lifestyle, Chinese association, entertainment from those days, 1880 and until now. Of course, we got a lot of cinemas and all that. Then festival, of course, the food, right? Of course, now, uh, lately in the limelight are the, the temple caves uh, already in the limelight. Some are 155 years old. The Tung Wa Tung in uh, Kambun Road is 150 years old, uh, where uh, our Yong Sinam was one of the people who contributed to the uh, cave temple. Uh. I was one of the people who supported this Tung Wa Tung and of course many other things. Uh. So these are important uh, heritage of the, the Chinese in Ipoh. Okay, so Ipoh before 1908, it was only Ipoh Old Town. There's no shops. They were only kampongs, right? Kampongs. Eh? And then, uh, of course, when Yao Tetshin came, Leong Fei came, they started at this uh, People's Park here, right? Uh, numbered number one here. People's Park number one here, where now the Palo Kumio is located. So People's Park is number 19. And now you all know uh, Changjiang Coffee has started taken over the people's park. They rented the place for 5,000 ringgit per month. Eh? Uh, and they are responsible to maintain the people's park. Okay. So uh, so then number three is the Chungshan Primary School. And then we have Yu Tong Sin Building. Now it's a medical hall. And then number five is the uh, Yau Tet Shin uh, Mansion, which is now converted into uh, this, uh, what do you call, Jabatan Kesihatan Negeri. So you can see the way I numbered the heritage trail. Eh? I always start with this Palo Kumio because this is the oldest temple in Ipoh. And this temple is very instrumental for the Hakka tin miners. No doubt the temple was built by the Hakka. If you look at the structure of the temple, it was actually built by the South China people from Hongzhou. Okay, so I will talk about it later. Then you know this is the old town where you can find a lot of old buildings. All the old buildings, what are the characteristics of old buildings? They were all, uh, you know, if you look at the back lane or even the front lane at Concubine Street and some of the streets, they were all very narrow, only suitable for the, what they call the horse cart or the bullock cart or what to pass by those days, eh? right? They were never built for cars. Then later when there's cars, you can see the Hoi Ho building there, the road become wider. Then the, the road next on the right side of Hoyano is called the Jalan Tun Sambatan. Uh, last time used to be a guest road where you can find 12 uh, guest houses there where all the Chinese uh, workers are staying, right? Chinese workers are staying. The Hakka miners and the Cantonese working in the tin mine, they were staying in the Kongsi at the tin mining. Only weekend, Saturday, Sunday, they all were 
throng to these places, the concubine street. Because here at the concubine street, uh, weekend they provide opium, uh, what do you call gambling, uh, prostitution, and all the four sins, we can name it. Uh, because these are the some of the Chinese people who actually got the permit from the British. Eh? Some don't even need to register. They got the, the big permit, like the Hanjin Petsu. Eh? Of course, you know Hanjin Petsu, uh, built by Yao Tekshin, all that. Eh? A group of rich teen miners, they don't even need to register under ROS at the time. Eh? Registrar Society, they were given permit for gambling, uh, prostitution and whatever. So the concubine street it actually provides uh, these four scenes for the poor. But the rich people, the Tauke, they use the Hanjin Petsu. Hanjin Petsu, Hanjan Pipsoya. Pipsoya means it's a bungalow, right? Where only the rich can go in. Of course, not only the rich, if you go to Hanjin Petsu, you can find uh, uh, the work of uh, our our Ian Anderson. Uh, uh, Ipo, Ipo, what I forgot. Uh. So they, they come up with that mock up, the uh, life size, uh, you know, make of those uh, seen in the uh, 1930s. Uh, where you can find the British there, the Japanese there. You see, the British, Japanese also spend their time at the club. Okay. Okay. Then there were big floods in uh, the old town, followed by a big fire. Why the fire happened? They cannot control the whole town was burned down because the, the what you call shop houses are all very close by each other right so they were burned down and uh, the second thing uh, they were always frequent flood because there's a Kinta river here and then at that time there was nothing here yeah here you can find a lot of this Malay kampong and a lot of this uh, pig farm there were about 72 pig farm along this river and the British they set up this uh, what you call the, the restaurants here. So all these uh, big, big farmers uh, uh, produce this uh, foul smell, uh, which the British cannot tahan. So what they do, they ordered, uh, ordered by this, uh, what do you call? Uh, Hume. Uh. Hume was the, the man in charge. He's like the town mayor, you know. He, uh, he uh, you know, ordered that all this uh, pig farm be shifted out. So when the order was given, Yao Tetshin found the opportunity. When this pig farm is moved, Yao Tetshin uh, bought over this land in the old, uh, in the new town. Eh? So he developed this uh, new town, in all the, the new shop houses. Eh? So you can see in the new town on the, the other side of the river, uh, the shop houses, uh, they have same characteristics like the one in the old town. But this time, uh, you will see the road is wider. Except the one uh, next, uh, the Lam Lok King building and Fung Siong building. If you see any building which is three story, these are the next stage, uh, which was not built by Yao Tet Chin. Yao Tet Chin built only two story building, right? Uh, which is uh, many in many parts of the new town. Eh? So I will come to this. Okay, so I have developed the trail, but tonight I'm not talking about the trail. Eh? So I printed, come up with nice one because I need to. Uh, get the state to approve. Huh? Uh, to, you know, once we approve, then I can tell you, I remember I mentioned in Cantonese, Lo Tong, Choi Tong. This is what I'm doing. Uh, we do it pro bono basis. I'm a counselor. I do it for the Chinese community without paid a single cent by the, the, the city council or the state government. But I want the state government to approve this project so that the, the city can be revitalized become more vibrant, more tourists come to Malaysia, spend a lot of tourist dollar. And of course, this is what, uh, on the 9th of February, an announcement will be made by the Menteri Besar about our low carbon city, walkable city. Uh, so our concept of Ipo Cantonese Trail is based on walkable city. Okay, so I will skip this part because uh, now it's already 9.15. Eh? Okay, now I show you very quickly and the people who are uh, responsible, yeah. The first one you see, Palo Kumio, it was just a very old building, but it is still important for the Chinese community. And it was written that our uh, this Hakka tin miners by the name of Leong Fei, he brought 
uh, the temple we call tablet. Eh? The tablet must bring must be brought from China. So he brought this to Penang. Remember just now I mentioned the two temple, eh? Tai Pak Kong in Penang, 1799. And this tablet now was brought to Ipo by Leong Fei and then placed at Palo Kumio. Why? Because the Chinese believe in protection by the God. Right? Protection for good health, for good business, and so on. Eh? Right? So after some time, uh, it was rebuilt to this condition until today. Otherwise, it will be collapsed. Eh? And this picture was taken in 1930. Eh? You can see at the bottom is the People's, People's Park. Okay, People's Park, and uh, at the end is the Palo Kumio. And on the left side here is the jetty. You can find this uh, jetty. Yeah? Okay, can you hear me, Dr. Leong? Can, can, can hear. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, no, Not yes. clear, yeah. Okay, yeah? quite clear. Yeah. Okay, this is the first spot. The second spot is the Chungshan Primary School, built by this, uh, what you call, Fung Xiong. Fung Xiong is a Cantonese. So he bought this. Uh, to support the freedom fighter Dr. Sun Yat Sen. And then this is our second market uh, in Ipoh. Uh, sorry, this is the first market on the left side where now you go to Old Town next to Ho Yan Ho, the part you find one street called Jalan Market. This is where the market was located. You can see this is how the market is. Behind this market, you, find, you can find this old building, still remain uh, this old building. And uh, you find a lot of bullock cuts here. And far end there is the what you call the, the bridge, eh, which is now replaced by the Sultan Idris Bridge. Bridge that time it was called the the Bush, uh, Bridge. Eh. Then later it was moved to uh, the second market here, which uh, is now located by this uh, Kinta Heights, eh, the twenty-story Kinta Heights. The, the second market was located here, uh, opposite this river. Is the jetty, uh, the not jetty, but the what you call uh, the tax collection center by Datuk Panglima Kinta, right? So uh, very nearby here, you can find a jetty, yeah, close by here. All right. Next part, uh, okay. Just now, market the third market is now where it is now located. The new market is the third market in Nipo. Eh? Okay. Next, we have the U Tonsing building. I told you, you can find a very nicely painted. The design still there, very nicely maintained. If you go there, it's a medical hall at the bottom, huh? since last time. Huh? So Yu Tonsin, he is famous in uh, Chinese herbs, but he is also famous in uh, rubber plantation and tin mine, tin mine as well, huh? right? Uh, and uh, if you, you read, you Google, you can find that he's the per first person in Perak who owned a motorized car with the plate number A1. Huh? Now the A1 has been given to the Sultan of Selangor. Of course, before A1, a para plate was uh, para plate started with the plate uh, P. Yeah? All the para plate starts with P. Then later on, when there's um, the first motorized car came into the picture, the British set up the what you call uh, uh, JPJ, yeah? the Road Transport Department. They started the numbering system. So A is for para, then B for Selangor, C for Pahang. Right, D for plantain and so on. Eh? All right. Okay, Yao Tetshin mentioned, I told you now uh, has been uh, turned into this uh, Jabatan Kesihatan, uh, State Health Department, located at Jalan Ku Chong Kong. Eh? Then we have this uh, Taiying Association. Of course, Taiying Association wasn't there, wasn't this big at that time. It was a small building. Of course, prominent people like uh, Yang Sina, Fu Chu Chun, Li Kui Fo, Lee Loi Singh, all this contributed a lot to this Kaying Association. So if you have chance, uh, Kaying Association is one of our, uh, what you call uh, Cantonese Heritage Trail Spot. I've spoken to Kaying Association. They agreed to create one uh, one floor for museum. Eh? So there you can find the statue of Leong Sinam, uh, made of bronze. Eh? Uh, you can find there. And uh, because of COVID, eh, it was closed for almost uh, two years. Eh? So we visited, I visited twice a day, and we have plans uh, to actually uh, resurrect back for the for the sake of the Chinese community. When I say Chinese community, not necessarily our local. Remember I said why the Chinese from China want to come to Ipoh? Because their ancestors are in Ipoh. Without this Chinese ancestor who slog in Ipoh, 
those people in China, they were not as what they are today. So today they are rich, it's reversed. So they always remember their ancestor. And this is part of the Chinese culture where they pray their ancestor. They always hope the ancestor will always protect them. Whether this is true or not, I don't know, but this is our Chinese culture and belief. Of course, we have the Chung Tai Ping building. Now they call it Alin's, uh, Alin's house, uh, named after the owner, the wife of the owner, Michael, Michael Chan. Uh. The owner is Michael Chan with the wife, uh, Alin. They want to rename it, but they still retain Kapitan Chung Tai Ping. Now has been turned into a museum. You gotta pay uh, before you can enter, but I like the the facade. They still retain, uh, which is good. Eh? Something very good. We must retain these kind of things. But you can find a lot of interesting inside the, the museum. Eh? I visited twice a day, but I think it's closed now eh? because of pandemic COVID. Next to Chung Tai Ping Building, uh, next to Ipoh Padang, you can find, of course, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. This is the British architecture, but next to it is. Para Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and the people instrumental in setting up PCCCI. Today is none other than Fu Chu Chun and Yao Tachin, both are Hakka. Okay? Then next to PCCI is the Para Hang Kang Kong, Kong Wei. Para Hang, Hang Kang Kong Wei. This is the Techu Association that shows there's a big group of Techu community. Eh? in uh, Ipoh, all right? Of course, uh, and next we have, uh, next to it, Jalan uh, Brewster Road, next to Durba, last time known as FMS building. So this is uh, FMS building. Eh? So about, I think, four or five doors away, you can find Wu Lente's clinic. So he was born in Penang, but he is a Cantonese who has spent a lot of time in Ipoh, all right? He is the champion of uh, uh, anti-opium, right? He set up the first anti-opium conference in Ipoh. He's very much against opium because this opium not only kill, but actually make our Chinese, eh, especially the Cantonese workers, poorer, right? Of course, he was uh, known to develop the face, first face mask eh, in the world, eh, right? Dr. Wu Lente. Of course, the clinic now is empty. I was told the building was... Uh, Belongs to what does previous YB, eh? Peter, what eh? Peter, Peter Chan, or what something like that. Okay, then uh, next to it, we have the Perak Pu Kong Chow Association. Eh? Uh, this building was built by Lam Loking, eh? was actually built by Lam Loking, but the notable people, uh, people like Kwang Tak Hing. Kwang Tak Hing is famous, eh? he's a Cantonese actor uh, acting as uh, Wong Fei Hong. Eh? Quite long, eh? many years he was Wong Fei Ho until uh, then uh, Jackie Chan, and then we have uh, now Jet Li eh? acting as uh, Wong Fei Ho. Eh? So the building has been rebuilt and uh, they plan to turn it into a museum eh? inside. And then, of course, Kong Hing, if you look at Kong Hing, uh, the building is uh, very much original, built in 1891. Next to it is Plan B. The Plan B is supposed to be a theater eh? uh, where they, they have opera shows. And those uh, the, those uh, performers, they stay here. There's a hostel for the, the performers uh, last time. Okay, So this uh, Kong Hing was built by this uh, uh, this uh, Yong Fei and uh, Yao Te Chin. Uh, because at that time, the Chinese Hatta, the team miners, they, they have very little entertainment. So the opera show is one of the major entertainment, source of entertainment. Uh, so they built this. They also have a team of people. They also sponsored them to perform in KL and so on. Eh? And finally, they now have uh, the para, uh, what do you call the Dramatic Culture Association uh, at the uh, old Fusan building, eh? above the old uh, Fusan building. Okay. okay, then Sun Cinema, no more there. Unfortunately, I have voiced out my displeasure at the city council. I say no more, right? Like the uh, Rack Cinema. I say we cannot do like Sun Cinema. This is heritage. We tear down this building. We should not allow any tearing down of a heritage building. Now it's empty here. Right? If you go to next to the river, you can find uh, next to Sri Kinta, opposite uh, what you call Telecom. Uh, uh, this building is gone, unfortunately. Yeah? 
right? It was built by uh, Leong Fei, you see? Leong Fei and uh, the British, uh, they come out with Sun Cinema, and you know the sun, the name after our this uh, Sun Yat Sen. Uh? And then, of course, uh, Kampong Hotel. Kampong Hotel, uh, it was not Kampong Hotel. Earlier, there was another name. I forgot. Uh, tonight, I forgot about. But this is the how the guest house streets it's, uh, uh, looks like. Uh, there are a lot of, there are 12 uh, hotels, like Kampong Hotel, where if you look at the building, uh, you go to this place, the building is 120 feet long by 20 feet, right? It can house, uh, it was famously known as 72, uh, 72, what do you call, uh, uh, 72 rooms hotel. Can you imagine uh, all these Chinese people, one big family stay in one room and there are 72 rooms, they all share. And of course, can you imagine when one of the occupants uh, fell sick and almost died, you are renting the place, will they allow you to die in that building? Of course not. And that's where the three Chinese association, they were responsible. The Pun Yi, Sun Ta, Nam Hoi, they actually started to do this kind of welfare service by providing uh, uh, what they call hostel for sick people. Then they were treated, the doctors will go there, treat them. If they are well, they go back to their unit. If they, are, they die, they will be, they perform the, the rites at the Hume Street, is it? That's where we have Sun Tak and Pun, we, uh, uh, we call it the sick and dead uh, centers, you know, right? So you can see, uh, I have taken photos from this, uh, now it's called, uh, uh, what do you call, Hill Street, huh? right? Hill Street, 21 Hill Street, it's a museum. You can find this uh, original, uh, what do you call, hot hotel, huh? those days. It's actually run, uh, they, they have prostitution here, gambling and so on, huh? right? Come, come, okay. So next we have the Para Mining Association. Uh, led by our Dato Sri Lao Pak Kwan, uh, for many, many years, uh, right? He's a Cantonese, uh, Ben Mai. Then we have Ho Yen Ho. Ho Yen Ho founded by Ho Kai Cheong. Uh. Ho Kai Cheong was born in Kuala Kangsa, and uh, the building was not there last time. Uh. The building was there, but it's not Ho Yen Ho. He actually sell his herbs next to the building. Number one, Theater Street. Uh. Right now, it's called Band Banda Jalan Bijedima. Uh. So, he was actually selling his herbs here on a bicycle. He managed to sell uh, about 1,000 cups a day. You know? Can you imagine? Uh? You know why it was so uh, so uh, good? Uh? Business was so good because the Chinese workers, uh, they don't have any other business. At that time, there's no Panadol or any other uh, medicine. Uh? So they rely on these Chinese herbs. Right? If they are hitty, they are not well, with the fever and all that, they just take these herbs, uh, uh, developed by our Ho Kai, Kai Cheong, uh, right? Uh, so, of course, uh, on and off, he went back to China to go and fight uh, during the war and came back, and then managed to set up again. And uh, we have this, uh, this building now turned into Ho Yen Ho Museum by his son, David Ho, right? In recognition of his father. Uh, now a museum, uh, you can visit this museum. And then next to it is Han Chin Petsu, right? And uh, of course, before he died, Ho Kai Cheong fulfilled his uh, ambition to be uh, to have a PhD uh, in uh, theology. Uh. He went to Hong Kong to study theology at the Pushkin University, right? Okay, so Han Chin Petsu, I told you, built by uh, Leong Fei and Yao Tet Shin. Uh. Then Concubine Street, of course, uh, who built the, the, the town? The person who built the town is Yao Tet Shin. And there were notes written to say that Yao Tet Shin has got four wives. Actually, I read some other article. Uh, Yao Tet Shin had more than four wives. Huh? Maybe four wives in Ipoh, another three wives in China. So this has not been proven. Huh? So we cannot say this is just hearsay. Uh, whatever they do in Ipoh, the concubine lane is meant for the concubine. Concubine means the mistress, right? And somebody created the first wife lane, the second wife, which is concubine, then the third wife lane. You know, can you imagine if you're rich, you've got a mistress, you want to give to your mistress a lane, you always give to the second wife. 
What about the first wife? The first wife you give him, give her a big bungalow, right? You, know, you cannot give a, a slave to the first wife. So that doesn't make sense. I cannot find any literature or document to say it is for the first wife, right? But the concubine lay is famous not for your information. Okay, the People's Park, it was uh, in 1990, like that. There was a bridge at that time. It was torn down and now turned into a nicer bridge. I told you, Paolo Cumio is here. And this uh, People's Park last time was a place where the Chinese would bring their tin ore and then they gather there, they go and sell their tin ore. And some traders, they sell food and all that right here. So it's quite an interesting place, right? So uh, they call it the people's part. The people gather here, and after selling the tin ore, they got to pay tax. The jetty is next to the people's part. Huh? Uh, Dr. Richard, can I ask you one question? Yes. Uh, this is DC Balu here. That uh, Remember the people's part, you said that, uh, that previously they were selling tin ore. Yeah. Are there any glimpses of uh, or remnants of uh, the tin ore selling uh, like a history, something there? Unfortunately, no, Dr. Balu. No oh. more. Everything is gone. The okay. Ipo City Council took over the place. They mm. landscaped the place. Of course, you cannot find any remnant at all. The oh, only okay. remnant available is the jetty. If we oh. go to the people's park by the river, that uh -huh. is the only remnant. Okay, uh, thank you. All right. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Next, uh, so we have uh, the, the association. Uh, so I will skip. Uh. Uh, I met this guy uh, called Dato Sri Desmond Lo just two days ago. Uh, I was quite fortunate. Uh, because I was doing research about the Para Emporium. I told you it was built by uh, Lamlo King. Uh. So Lamlo King engaged a, a Danish architect by the name of B.M. Iverson. So you see uh, the the white man eh, built three story. Yao Tachin can only build two story. So Yao Tachin building eh, is not strong, you know. Uh, there was once at Hulo Street, one lorry went knocked down near one traffic light eh, at Hulo Street in front of the police station. The building collapsed, you know. Now no more already the building, right? Because the building, there's no what it calls steel structure or what, nothing. Only the British can do that, all right? Okay, now, then uh, there was this uh, British, uh, the, the what called Para Emporium. I told you now. Then after later on, it was not doing well. Then it was on fire. And the place was, was left idle for almost 20 years until this guy called Dr. Sri Desmond, he took over, refurbished this place. He told me that day he spent uh, $2 million to refurbish. I asked him, how do you find this place? He said, excellent. The place was excellent. And everything, eh? so he he's actually a Cantonese, eh? so I am going to have a date with him. I he has he kept a lot of documents about this Lam looking building, which I want to see and uh, take note, eh? so I can uh, update my my book with it. So I got this uh, a bit of luck. Eh? Met this guy. This guy is the vice president of the Para Chamber Chinese Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Then Feng Xiong again, you see, you know, it's also a three-story building next to it, only. Opposite uh, the UTC, yeah, uh, next to UTC. But of course, the building is a bit run down. Uh, the top floor was actually a some choice school, uh, private school, right? Primary school. Now this uh, school has moved to uh, Pasipinji, yeah, uh, some choice, right? Uh, but the building is still there at the uh, ground floor. Uh, they still sell shoes and all that. And uh, last week, my research partner says they found the. Uh, the, what they call uh, the grandchildren of Feng Xiong. Uh, so we have the chance to interview them. They agreed to be interviewed. So we're going to do a bit of research of uh, this building because nothing much was written about this Feng Xiong, is it? Feng Xiong is a Cantonese. Of course, uh, Yao Tetshin was, uh, was recognized through a street called Yao Tetshin Street. If you go there, it's colorful today. It's a tourist attraction area. You see many of these uh, what you call uh, building has got Chinese uh, uh, words uh, written on it. These are the name of the shops, those days and all that. So I told the city council, anybody who took over, they must not remove all this work. They can repaint, but uh, we want them to maintain, even though this is not the name of the company. We want to retain because this is the heritage of Ipoh, uh, just for your information. Because now you see another 
a street sir, called Datuk Tawil last night was called Osborne Street. I tell you Osborne, eh? it was a uh, minor, British minor, but uh, the mid street uh, named after him. Of course, if you see the road eh, is uh, made of uh, unlevel, uh, so it's purposely made that way so that uh, we don't want the car to drive too fast. If you go to Kongjo, near the Kongjo Hotel in the older older part of Kongjo, I, I was there three years ago, I also found this kind of material to slow down the, the traffic. This is actually meant to be walking street. So later on, we're going to propose uh, this to be car free. So all this car park will be moved out of the other parts of the city and we will provide uh, what you call uh, uh, EV, uh, electric vehicle or electric uh, buses uh, to send them to this uh, tourist attraction place. And those, why is this place prominent? Uh? Because this is a red light district during the 30s. Uh, you can find prostitution, gambling and all that. And at the far end is the Fusan uh, where now the Para Dramatic Association uh, is located. Right? And of course now doing well, uh, we have this uh, Right, we have low wall and uh, and so many there, right? Doing very well, eh? right? Uh, so this is the the Para Dramatic, eh? Chinese Dramatic uh, Association, eh? It's located. Uh, last time was Busan, now it was turned into what purple tea or what something like that, eh? uh, So next is the Punyi Association. I will skip uh, Octagon, eh? So two days ago I was there. They light up the lantern and all that. Eh? And of course, now there's a, a request by PCCI for me to help them eh? uh, to create a street there. Earlier, they, they want to name it as Chinatown. I objected because Ipoh itself is a Chinatown. So we cannot have a Chinatown at that location. So I have proposed to PCCI at a meeting. I say, why not turn into Yao Tet Shin Memory Lane? Right? Because this bazaar was famous. Eh? It's called the Yao Tek Shin Bazaar Market. It was torn down, torn down in 1962 because the structure was unsafe. Then the PCCI took over the tender. They got this, this uh, land. So they built Octagon, uh, which is a landmark today. Eh? So, of course, uh, I agree with their proposal, provided they don't name it Chinatown. Eh? So this part of the, the, old, the new town is built dark at night, not vibrant. So I hope I can help them to turn this part of the city uh, into a vi vibrant uh, district. Uh. Okay, of course, uh, in that uh, location that uh, we have Puni and, uh, you know, and then Nam Hoi uh, nearby. Nam Hoi is our very important uh, partner in uh, this Cantonese research. Uh. Leong Sinam Street, right? Named after Leong Sinam. Of course, he has contributed a lot. And uh, there's a street now famous with dim sum. And a lot is, is actually a street food. Eh? So this is going to be made famous eh? later on. We're going to zone this into a street food area. Of course, ma che, ma che are mates, Chinese made. Eh? So I will, later, Dr. Leung, I will talk one topic on ma che. Very interesting, but I'm still gathering a lot of information. Uh, I have proposed to the mayor, we're going to turn this into ma che museum. Because there are a lot of people I met, they are willing to donate a lot of belongings of my chair. Uh, so, if we successfully uh, uh, create a museum, then our future generation will be able to understand what is my chair. So, my chair basically they are like mates, uh, Indonesian mates. The only difference is the Indonesian mates they got family. The my chair doesn't have family. They actually ran away from their family without letting their family know. All right, so they are like the Yunnan for the men, they are Yunnan. The female, they actually uh, take an off at the altar. They married to the they are married to the dead, so that they in case they die one day, uh, when they are buried, then they have a partner, companion uh, during life after their death. All right, so that that is a culture there. We'll talk about it. Uh, the photo here I would like to share to you uh, is one marche. If you look at her finger, she got a gold ring. She got a gold ring. She is quite elderly, and uh, she sent this uh, this boy to a barber. And you see, there's electrical uh, electric, uh, uh, what you call, uh, you know, these uh, tools. Uh. So this boy must be a rich Taukesan, uh, 
Rich Tau Kes lah. Maybe Dr. Leong or what? I don't know lah. Dr. Leong. Maybe you have to find out lah. Maybe it was you, your your grandfather sent you here. I don't know lah. So, this marcher, they, they they are not married. They will stay uh, until they die. But of course, weekend, they got a place to stay. This is where they all, 25 of them, uh, put in money and then they bought this building. Of course, because they don't have uh, beneficial, uh, what, uh, what you call uh, people, uh, the trustees, uh, uh, when they die, uh, so we have problem. How to transfer this title? So we have no choice. I told uh, the city council to gazette this into uh, what you call museum. I saw this. I also saw this structure in KL. I was fortunate when I went to KL, I met one guy by the name, name of uh, Jack Lee. Uh. Jack Lee is a Hainan. Hainan who set up a coffee team. Uh. Uh, enjoy good food, enjoy good story. He told me a lot of things, so I got a lot of information about Marche. They also bought a building in KL, and he was one of the trustees. When the building finally got sold, because he was a trustee, it's not, it was not easy. The building was sold in KL at two million dollars. Can you imagine? Those days was only what thirty, forty thousand, and by the time he sold off the building, they got two million. He brought this two million to China, get all these people uh, met in Hong Kong, throw a, a dinner there, and then ask them to foot the bill. Nobody foot the bill, so he foot the bill and uh, take responsibility of uh, the day and whatever. All right? Okay. Finally, uh, Lao Eching. Uh, spot number 32. Uh. So I have told you already, opposite our club uh, is actually uh, opposite our Dr. Leong's uh, club, uh, club. What we call it, club street. Uh. Okay, so uh, you find a lot of interesting building there, very nice uh, architecture. But unfortunately, this Ruby Cinema now has been turned into uh, a place where they sell furniture. And I think no more selling also, closed down also. Uh. So I told the uh, mayor, all this become heritage building. Whoever take over, this facade must be retained. And the name Lao Eching must be there, cannot be removed. Just like Chung Taiping building, you can put Alin House, but the Chung Taiping name must be there. Similarly to other buildings. So you see now, we are serious, huh? because this uh, heritage thing, we are actually lagging behind Penang. Of course, we are 100 years behind Penang in terms of heritage but it's still not too late, all right? So come February 9th, we're going to declare uh, uh, the, uh, what you call, uh, walkable city uh, and low carbon city. Okay, so the Can Cantonese culture, let me tell you a little bit before I end. Uh, in China, when the, the Qing dynasty was defeated in 1918 by Sun Yat-sen and his followers, all right? The second man of Sun Yat-sen, did not follow Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen right hand man was Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek and the other man, I forgot. But the other man worked with Mao Zedong to form the communist government. So they fight with this uh, Sun Yat-sen and Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek, they actually uh, ran away to Taiwan. So they, uh, they, they stay in Taiwan to form another country. So in China, the whole, you know, Mao Zedong's uh, strategy is to unite the whole of China. So he recommended all the Chinese to use Hu Tonghua, which is the Mandarin, Hu Tonghua. But the Cantonese in Guangzhou, they refused to accept this. They will not want to change. So they, they, they will read the Chinese Mandarin words, but their pronunciation is still uh, Cantonese. They so say you go to Guangzhou, they all speak Cantonese. And this is where I tell you the Cantonese language, culture still remain, despite the communist uh, people, communist government threaten them, they still uh, quietly, secretly, they still speak among themselves. In school, they use Mandarin words, but they speak in Cantonese, right? So instead of saying Hu Tonghua, the, the Chinese, the Cantonese in Guangzhou, they say Hu Tonghua. You know, I tell you, uh, Cantonese words, uh, there are a lot of nasty words. Uh, a lot of people don't understand. If you speak wrongly, it become different meaning. So these are the Cantonese culture in Ipo. We still can find the opera show because of COVID. There's no opera show, but later we're going to revive. Then, of course, we have lantern during mooncake and all that. 
Then we have the Palo Pumio. You see the architecture, they're all made by the Cantonese, eh? all right? And then this is the Punyi, the sick and uh, dead place. Eh? So there's uh, this uh, Ma Chair altar, eh? you go there. Uh, so we're gonna turn this into a museum now. Eh? So I've already spoken to Punyi, we will help them to convert. So this is the Palo Pumio, eh? you see, it's a hundred, more than 150 years old, eh? since 1892, if I'm not mistaken. Eh? And on the right hand side, I told you, is the Chinese character on the pillar. Eh? We still need to retain that culture. Of course, in terms of food, uh, food, Ipo is famous with dim sum. This is also Cantonese food. The roasted pork, roasted chicken, they're all Cantonese food, eh? not other other ethnic group. The Cantonese are very good in uh, roasting the, the, the pig, you know. Then, of course, Ipo famous with Ma Choi. The bean sprout eh, in Buntong, these are Cantonese uh, culture. Of course, the Ho Fan. Ho Fan in China came from one uh, place called uh, Sa. So we have Sa Ho Fan, right? Sa Ho. Eh? So we have mooncake. Of course, now we've got many varieties of mooncake uh, made by other ethnic, but still the Cantonese is the best. The egg tart from Cantonese, the wonton mi, eh? right? And then, of course, uh, you have heard of Bruce Lee, Ip Man, Wong Fei Hong, all right? And uh, some of these Chinese skills, uh, uh, they, they repair clocks, they repair fountain pen, and uh, they are in the foundry business and so on. Uh, okay? So, uh, last but not least, the Chinese Association, they met the, the mayor. So, we have this uh, Mr. Lau from Nam Hoi. Uh, we have the late uh, Mr. Ho, right, from uh, this uh, Pun Yi. Uh, Suntak, sorry. Then we have the chairman of Puni and uh, Mr. Mark. All these are instrumental uh, in helping me. Uh, my research assistant is not here, all right? But he, I think he's listening right now. Uh. Okay. All right. So I will stop here, Dr. Leong. I think I speak more than one hour, uh, but I think it's important uh, to share yes. with you this. Okay. Thank you very much. Very, very good. Yeah. Thank you so much. You are actually a very good historian as well now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, I've learned a lot from you actually. So much of the history. Yeah, going back so late. Yeah. Thank Sorry you. Yeah.